to go right back to the time of the murder, where she lost a friend. She could have then become an entrenched, violent criminal because she was very, very angry about what happened. It could have gone either way. Prisons are violent, and when there's violence, the way that you survive in prison is to retaliate. So, yeah, there was a plan, and it would have been a bloodbath. And somehow, something clicked in her head. To actually switch your mind around and suddenly be a power for good, if you like, was just an amazing, amazing thing. She had to make most of her opportunities. Nothing much was presented to her on a plate. And she made history by becoming the first woman with a criminal history to be sworn in at the bar. I am a lawyer. I'm in there for the struggle of women. I want to see children, girls, women to be able to live in a world that they're free of any form of violence, abuse, of racism, of all those issues. She's not a saviour. She would cringe if she heard that, because she knows she's not and she doesn't want to be. She's just an amazing independent woman and she'll get done what she needs to get done for these women that she's supporting. to us so we don't have to appear on Monday or...? For over 25 years now, Deb has been fighting to keep women and girls out of prison. I'm just trying to um, eliminate, you know. Some days I feel like an absolute failure because prisons are getting bigger. But I think people would say I have dedicated my life to fight. <laughs> She's 12. Mm. She's charged with very serious offences and we have no contact because she's on a child protection order. She knows that when a judge or a magistrate sentences a woman, she's not just being sentenced herself. That impact goes on to her children. It becomes a generational thing. And of course, Deb's own children have been impacted by that. I was with um, someone just this week and the child had 13 foster, foster homes and then she's put in residential care as a 10-year-old, and then they get charged with offences in resi care. And then the resi care workers want to come here to the law firm and sit in on the meeting where they're the complainant. It's like you've actually called the cops on the kids, got them arrested, and then you want to pretend that you're their support person. Yeah, no, sorry. That ain't working. It ain't flying here anyway. She's been there. And she still recognises all these years later her own pain in those young women and she'll never forget and doesn't want to forget because that's what really keeps her in touch with, with those people. I grew up in a small house in Brisbane. It was a happy household, so I was really lucky in that sense. But when I was 13, I was experimenting. I was pushing the boundaries. I was trying to work out who I was. School was boring and the teachers would give me a hard time and make me sit outside the principal's office all day. And it's like, well, I wasn't doing that, so I'd just take off. We'd had a call from the school at one point there that uh, Debbie had uh, gone off in a car with some boys and I think she ended up at Cunnamulla. We were advised by the juvenile aid that the best thing to do for Debbie and for us was to have her admitted to the Wilston home for a, a psychiatric assessment. It was the worst decision that we had ever made as parents. So in them days, that's what the youth prison was called. It was a medical model. I was going there for treatment, to be treated because of this uncontrolled behaviour, which wasn't the case. We were brutalised. I went through a process of being strip searched, drugged up most of the time, locked up. Not long after I was there, I was told there was some bad news from home. Dad had died quite suddenly, and, uh, and that still hurts. Dad was 38, and I found out that his heart had collapsed in his chest. And the matron told me over and over again that I'd killed my father, and that I was bad, 
and that it was my fault that he was dead. So I was a 14-year-old child being told that. This is where Debbie probably went really over the edge, you might as well say, and didn't care about anything or anybody. I did get involved in crime then. I would continue to escape from the prison and I would run the streets. I fell pregnant and had my first child when I'd just turned 17. Jody's father was a very violent man and I was severely beaten all through that pregnancy. I provoked all the men in my life um, to bash me and I would poke the bear, like the violent partner, to be violent, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, not taking away from their violence. Like, I felt for many years that I deserved to be punished for killing my father, but I really didn't know that that was happening or the reason why I would stay in violent relationships. I met Joe in my early 20s. From the outside of Kilroy. Kilroy's in the corner. Try for the Broncos and they're back to the lead. I mean, he was good looking. He was, you know, fun. Here, and he was a really good football player. Joey Kilroy. Yes, he's going in the corner. So it wasn't long before he turned into Joe Kilroy, legend of the Broncos team that lit up the football field for years. He would always ask me to marry him. I said to Joe, well, do you want to get married? He's like, yeah. I said, all right, well, he's organise it and I might be there. It was just raw adrenaline. I mean, it's extremely volatile. You know, and sometimes, like, just... Hell, where did all this come from, you know? I just... I'd never experienced it before or met anyone like it. There was Joe who's grown up in an orphanage and has no skills in the sense of a relationship. And me, who's been in a youth prison, no skills in a relationship. So when there was conflict, because we didn't know how to resolve it, it'd be like, boom. One night I came home drunk and I deliberately woke Joe up to have a fight. Just abused him for like 40, 45 minutes. You know, the kids were asleep. So in the end, I just picked her up, just cradled her in my arms and went to walk her down. I was just going to drop her in the bloody shallow end of the pool, you know, snap out of it, you tool. But um, unfortunately for her, when I was carrying her, she grabbed the door frame. And my wedding ring and engagement ring had hooked onto it. And, I've set, and he's pulled me and I said, I've, I'm stuck. And he pulled me and just the angle that it was on and his strength. Like, I didn't even know. Like, it ripped the whole finger off. And then she held it up in the moonlight. Then we could see the finger was gone. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. Wedding finger too. Life had become pretty well out of control then. Joe would smoke a bit of dope. We would buy extra dope to sell, so it didn't cost anything for, for his personal use. I didn't like drugs. I didn't do drugs. But I would get greedy, and so it was about making money, and I actually then was trafficking the marijuana, yeah. Well, they got undercover cops to come and get into our lives. One had attached themselves to Joe, and one had attached themselves to me. Police raids netted seven kilograms of cannabis resin, said to be worth $100,000. She sold heroin to an undercover agent, so... Which was against everything I believed in, you know? I'm, I'm anti-needles, anti-heroin, so... It was very hard for me. It absolutely shattered me, actually. I put my hand up for what I did, but I did not traffic heroin. I was in a room, um, on four separate occasions where heroin was passed, like a quarter of a pound, to me to pass to the undercover copper. I would pleaded guilty to trafficking in marijuana and poor possessions of heroin. Joe ended up handing himself in with the lawyer. 
Smoke and Joe Kilroy visited CIB headquarters by appointment this morning. After a five-hour interview, he was led to the watch house charged with trafficking, supplying and possessing a dangerous drug. He's a bronco. He's, yeah, high profile. I was portrayed as the wicked witch of the West and he was poor Joe Kilroy that was led astray. Joe got sentenced to three years and I got sentenced to six years got taken down to the cells and Joe went to um, touch my hand and said, don't even touch me, like, because I was just so wild about what had just played out. And that was like, I am so done with you, mate. Separation had nothing to do with love lost, OK? It wasn't about losing love or anything like that. It was just wasn't a healthy place to be for neither of us, I don't think. Well, our children, Joshua was two and Jodie was 11. Jodie went and lived with Mum and Joshua went and lived with my grandmother. That was another mistake. We should have kept the children together. It would have been a lot better. But at the time, it was the only way we could do it. We had to work out what was the best at the time. When I went to prison in 1989, I wasn't worried. Like, I knew what prison is. It was Christmas, just Christmas had ended and New Year's, and it's a time in women's prisons that's very, very stressful. There was conflict there. I'm still not clear what it was ever about. I was sitting at a dining room table with my friend. We were attacked by two women. So I was stabbed twice at my ribs on both sides, front and back, and my friend was stabbed multiple times. We were both uh, rushed to the hospital in ambulances. Um, however, my friend died at the hospital. I was deeply hurt and grief-stricken, but I didn't show it externally because I needed to survive in that violent prison. She'd lost her friend and she had hatred inside her. She remembered hearing the screams of the woman who was convicted of the murder, who was then in solitary, and she would think, good, good, you deserve this, and we're gonna get you as well. Until one day, she listened to the woman making these animal noises of anguish and started to feel that they somehow mirrored the feelings she'd had as a child in the lockup. And as soon as she recognised it as something she'd felt, she lost the desire for revenge. That murder set in motion a, a complete change in the way we dealt with women prisoners. And Debbie was a major driver of that happening because she had such influence with the other prisoners. When she saw that there was a chance to have reform within that prison to change the way the prison ran, she decided to buy into that. She was asked to speak to this group of invited guests about her experience of being inside youth detention and all its cruelties. It was the first time that I'd spoken really about what had happened to Dad and how the matron blamed me for his death. I just broke down into absolute grief. I could actually say I didn't kill him. It all stopped, the violence then stopped, and that's when I could move forward. So my plan was that I'm gonna get an education. I think I did every course in prison. And eventually the education officer went and negotiated with Queensland University for me to be enrolled in social work. The whole purpose of the social work was to challenge what the system is doing to women and girls. I knew that we'd all come from a similar place, which was poverty, violence. And I knew that if the authorities didn't make the decisions that they made when I was a 13-year-old. I would not have been where I was. When I'd got parole and come out of prison, I'd said to the women, I'll be back. Let's start our own organisation. So we did. <laughs> we started Sisters Inside to support women in prison and women coming out of prison to transition back into the free world. I got my conditional release didn't get approved. I know I've stuffed up, but... And, you know, most crucial part of the structure is about the women in prison make the decisions. 
No, I don't believe any woman should be in prison. You no, it kills fair. your feeling. Mm -hmm. It kills my feeling. Sisters Inside covers not only the on the ground working day to day, one on one with women and supporting women and walking alongside women, but also the advocacy stuff. And I know from time to time she's rubbed certainly public servants up the wrong way uh, because she's very blunt in their, her approach to them. And I've been with her in meetings where, yeah, quite amazing how she uh, takes people on. They said that they were doing everything under your instructions. The Minister... Minister Debbie and I are poles apart. Some of the people that Debbie advocates for have uh, committed horrendous crimes. Um, who, like, you know, so I admire her and I respect her. She is a very good advocate and she knows that you've got to build relationships, she knows you've got to build networks, uh, but she doesn't hold back. It was a couple of years after I got out of prison that Joe and I got back together. We basically renegotiated our marriage. There would be no more violence, you know, because that was the behaviour that I did, that I hated. Everything else was OK. We have a long history and um, we don't want to give up on each other either. That'd be nice. The water's a bit glassy today. It's nice and flat there. Mm. Gee whiz. <laughs> Probably going to prison saved our marriage. You know, because it gives us the time apart, the time to look at ourselves, each other, and, and just realise, you know, you can't keep living like this. Something's got to give. And I didn't want my family to give. For the children, the biggest impact has been on Jodie. She's presently in prison now, and that's something that, you know, I'm not happy about, obviously, but, I mean, um, she has to live her life. She's an adult now. Jodie Harris is charged with siphoning more than $160,000 from the bank accounts of 16 people. She's in there for fraud charges. She had to go through those terrible years when her mother and father were in jail, and she never even had it easy at school. Children can be so cruel, and the children at school gave her a terrible time. We're hoping that she, like a mother, will find the right path in time. That's all we can hope, it's all we can pray for. A couple of years after we started Sisters Inside, I decided to study law. I actually wanted to be in a courtroom and support women going through the court process, it took me a long time, I did it part-time, was still working. Everybody said to me, don't waste your time, you're never going to be admitted. Debbie was seeking admission as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of Queensland. I was to argue for her admission. I, I gave her kind of 50-50 and I think that was almost being a little optimistic. No one with her criminal record, and it was a serious criminal record for drug offences, had ever successfully applied to be admitted as either solicitor or barrister. The test was, was she basically a fit and proper person? I put me and my life on the line. Like, I know where I've come from, and I know where I'm going. I'm rehabilitated, so if you're going to tell me you're not, I'm going to challenge you and appeal it, because I actually want to know when will I ever be rehabilitated? The Chief Justice made comments to the effect uh, that he'd never seen a case like this before. Nobody could quite tell where he was going with this, but then he got to the end and he said, and I'm pleased to announce that we have decided that you will be admitted to the bar. Then we had our own cheer squad in there. And I think it went against the grain of tradition, but it's a tremendously inspiring thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed, yeah. <laughs> So all of this stuff started happening, you know, graduated law and nominated for Telstra Businesswoman of the Year and got an Order of Australian Medal and was nominated for Australian of the Year. Like, clock that, you know what I mean? We're driving to Ipswich to this little one's court case um, and... The people I represent have been charged with criminal offences. So there could be any type of offences from public nuisance to evading fares all the way to murder. That's predominantly legal aid work or pro bono work. She could be out in a law practice somewhere earning big bucks, but she's not. She's in there working at the coalface of probably the most disadvantaged people in our society. 
can't say too much about that one. Little 15 year old just got committed to the Queensland Children's Court, heading back to the watch house and then back out to the youth prison. Deb really went in a, a new and interesting direction when she realised that women in Western Australia were being imprisoned for the non-payment of fines. It was the story of what happened to Miss Jew that brought the issue into the national spotlight. Julika Jew died last month after complaining of feeling unwell while being held in custody at the South Headland Police Station. She was arrested for warrants for unpaid fines. She was treated absolutely appallingly by the police and the medical people. She died a horrific death in that watch house. There was an inquest and the coroner said very clearly in the findings to change these laws to stop imprisoning people who can't pay fines. And still today, it, it hasn't happened. I'd been seeing this GoFundMe type of campaigning, you know, on social media. I hadn't taken much notice of it, but I thought, I'm going to try that. So then I'm thinking, we could actually raise money for Aboriginal mothers to pay their warrants so they don't come into prison. I didn't know how many women had warrants. I didn't know how much their warrants were. And I just jumped in and hit send and out it went to the, you know, the Cosmo, so to speak. So the original goal was like $100,000. And I think it hit like 100,000 in like 24, 30 hours. So they upped it to 150, then they hit 150. So they upped it to 200, so then they hit it 200. So it just was this, thing that just kept building and building and growing and then celebrities were retweeting and like women from Orange is the New Black were retweeting it in America like Yael Stone, you know, and so it was crazy. It, it completely blew Twitter's head. Like it was trending on Twitter. It was crazy. I think people don't like the injustices. I think this campaign has proved that. So you've got some fines, infringement fines yep. and court fines? Yes. Yep. So okay. $14,000 worth. In total? In total? Wow. And do you know what their fines are for? Um, mainly for speeding. Um, okay. But a lot of it has accumulated over not being able to pay the fine. So it's come a fine on top of a fine mm. on top of a fine. With fees and yeah. stuff. Yeah. All my fines go back, going back from when I'm 18. I'm 36 now. I've actually done a night in lockup over it. I've got five kids. We have raised over $400,000 and expended just over $383,000. 11 women have been released from prison and we have paid 122 women's fines so they don't end up in prison. Hello. Hi Sam, it's Debbie here from Sisters Inside. We've paid all your court fines this afternoon. Oh, it would have been over a month in prison. So what we've got to do is work on um, getting you on a payment plan for an infringement fine. I was actually in shock at first, and then started crying. And then just thanked her for it. It's a relief. The Western Australian Government is dragging their feet. It's the only jurisdiction left in this country that actually issues warrants for unpaid fines and puts you directly into prison. And it's, they need to step up and change the laws. Dad, would it be? Yeah, he would have been. I don't know, you'd have to ask him. I'm the only person in my family who hasn't been to jail. Well, this is old Bob Road. And Jodie, my sister, she was in and out of jail my entire life, and then she got out fully, I think it was like 2009 or 10. Debbie and Jodie went through a period of estrangement, which was difficult for everybody. Good old calendars in prison. Paul. But they've been able to reconnect again. Jodie's married her soulmate and they're living happily together and she's working full time and doing really well. We have over the years slowly been working on, you know, our strained relationship, but she is my daughter, I am her mother and I will always love her.
something that I've always known is the revolving door of different types of women um, always coming through our house and staying. Did you say hello? Deb just offered, you know, I can stay here with her. You know, she welcomed me into her home. Yeah, then everything just kind of fell into place. Zoff's mum and I were in prison together, so I've known Zoff all her life. Nettarie's had her struggles in life and she works at Sisters Inside as well as Zofia now. She's so many things. She's our boss, she's like our mother, our second mother. She's a nana to my baby, to both of our babies. Yeah. They both call me Nana, Nana Deb, and I take that role very seriously and I love them very dearly. <laughs> I want to protect those girls. I want to protect all those little children that they don't experience racism and violence in the world. But it's going to be a very difficult task. Not the <laughs> There's something in her that will keep fighting even when the fight's won. Because there'll always be something to fight for. Put it in your mouth. Died 1977, 20. 